Castlevania is a game series that I've never really had very much personal attachment to compared to other games. But after replaying the original Castlevania, I have a newfound appreciation for how it pioneered game design in an era when video games... kinda suck. Don't get me wrong, I love retro games, but in the mid-80s, emphasis on mid, it was a rough transition period for the gaming industry. Gaming was no longer a fad where you just play a game for five minutes and you've already seen all it had to offer. Games were becoming the unique entertainment and interactive way we experience stories that we know today. In the 80s, most third-party developed games, hell, even games developed by Nintendo themselves, failed to meet the basic standards of game design we expect from games in the modern era. Have you played Kid Icarus? The reason for that is because games couldn't really have tutorials. There were no concrete game design philosophies and way to make a cohesive experience all the way through. There was no known way to make a consistently good video game. Therefore, game mechanics usually weren't taught to the player, leaving them confused as how to progress. And even if a game had a memorable start where it properly taught the player its mechanics with good level design, it couldn't keep that momentum past the first area. So you had game designers who were unsure of what they were doing, but you also had game designers who couldn't give less of a shit about making a good game and only did it to sell toys or promote TV shows. I think the most famous example of this is LJN. But what sets Castlevania apart from these other disasters and what cements it as a timeless classic? Well, at the beginning of the first level, we find Simon in a big, fat-ass open space with no obstacles and no enemies. This is a common game design trope in many good games from this time period, specifically Mega Man where each of the eight beginning levels put the player in an open area so that, no matter what level you start with, you get a safe space to press random buttons to figure out the controls. Castlevania does the same thing, allowing the player to learn the unique jumping mechanics, how to whip, and that whipping objects gives them hearts. Someone playing this game for the first time will probably assume that the hearts you collect are for healing. However, that's not the case. What exactly the hearts are for is not immediately communicated to the player, but we'll get back to that in a second. We go into the castle and find ourselves face to face with these ghost skeleton things. One thing you'll notice about Castlevania is that a lot of enemies move faster than Simon, so the player is forced to attack out of panic. This is done so you understand how to make use of your primary weapon's long range. All of a sudden, the skeleton ghosts stop coming, and you're met with a dog. Another design choice that I like from this game is that when you're shown a new enemy or obstacle, none of the previous obstacles can spawn in, so that a new player is able to focus on dealing with the new threat. Okay, look, I got hit but still no other enemies spawn as I fight a second dog, and this time I know how to deal with it. Like I said, if I was a new player, I would expect the hearts I get to heal the damage I just took. This doesn't happen, which would only further confuse a new player. But don't worry, because this game has a trick up its sleeve. Right after this area, we find ourselves in a room where a bat spawns from the other side of the screen towards us. Once again, this bat moves faster than you, therefore you're forced to act quickly and kill it. When you go down the stairs, a second bat comes towards you and you're forced to do the same. 
I didn't even realize this until I played through this section again and again. But every time I've broken this particular wall, it was because I was forced to hit this bat, essentially discovering by accident that some walls can be broken in order to find items and health. I believe that this section is intentionally designed so that a new player figures out that not only can you break open walls, but also that you use the meat in the wall to heal your damage. In any other game at this time period, this would be a hidden cryptic mechanic that would never be properly taught to the player. In a different game, this mechanic would stay hidden and the player would almost never learn how to get their health back. An otherwise cryptic mechanic is taught to the player through level design. The next section shows another game design choice that I like. Scaring the player and conditioning them into acting quickly under pressure. You see, this is the first part of the game where the player has to jump over pits. Adding to that initial stress is a new enemy that pops out of the water. In reality, unless you intentionally hit the fishmen, you can get through this area pretty easily. You may have noticed that we have been collecting weapons along the way through this level. Now, how do we use these weapons? The game, once again, does not immediately tell us. But we don't have time to think about that because we're at the first ball. How it works is the giant bat will stay above you and occasionally swoop down to hit you. It's possible to beat this boss without using the secondary weapons, however it might be very difficult for a newcomer. They might be thinking, is there an upwards attack? And then, if they try pressing up and B at the same time, they'll discover that they can use the secondary weapon shown in the HUD. Coincidentally, the weapon they give you right before the boss is the axe, which is perfect for fighting the giant bat. Pressing up and B to do a separate attack is a mechanic that was seen in many games at this time period. It was never really organically taught in any of these games though, except for Castlevania. And finally, we figured out what the hearts do. They are ammo for the weapon that you have at the time. I honestly don't know why Konami chose to represent weapon ammo with hearts, but at least it's somewhat communicated to the player. Anyways, once I've finished the first level, I can now experiment with each new weapon I get over the course of the game to figure out which weapons are useful in which situations. There's knives, which are good for tacking from afar. There's crosses, which are just better version of the knives because they attack through multiple enemies at once. While the knives can only hit one enemy and then they just go away. The axes are good for attacking enemies above you. Although, other than the first boss fight, the axes really aren't useful at any other point in the game. And when I put it like that, it really seems like the axes were put into the game for the sole purpose of teaching the player how to use the secondary weapons. There's also the clock, which stops time for a few seconds, which is useful for bosses and enemies that take many hits to kill. Finally, there's the Holy Water, which is a short-range weapon that does tons of damage, and I'll actually talk about Holy Water later. Level 2 introduces the first enemies that take more than one hit to kill, the slow-moving knights and the statues that stay completely still shooting fireballs at you. These enemies aren't very hard to take out, and the weapon that this stage gives you, those being the cross and the clock, are perfect for these enemies. At the end of the first section, we see a moving platform going over a short gap with some blocks under it in case the player falls. 
Later in the level, there's the same moving platform with blocks under them, except now the gaps are much wider, and Medusa heads can spawn in this area. Well, they're supposed to anyways, but sometimes they just don't show up. What I'm trying to say is that this level will introduce new obstacles in a relatively safe area so that the player can learn how to deal with it, and then later on in the level we see the same obstacle, except now it's more dangerous. We see the same thing with the Medusa head enemies. When we first encounter the Medusa heads, it's in an area with no pits so that the player can fully focus on getting down the zigzag pattern that the Medusa heads follow. Then a bit later, we get to a part where we need to jump over pits while dodging Medusa heads. One part of this level that I don't enjoy, however, is this section with these falling spikes. It seems simple, you wait and walk under them as quickly as possible when they come up. But the middle one falls faster. What you have to do for the middle one is walk under and then duck. The problem with this is that you instantly die if you touch the spikes, so this really seems like a malicious trap for first time players. And the weird thing is, these are the only spike traps we see in the whole game, so it seems extra malicious when I put it like that. Anyways, the boss in this area is Medusa herself. Like the first boss, it's very easy, and it's meant to show the player how effective the secondary weapons can be for taking out harder enemies. So level 2 was a bit harder, however level 3 is where the difficulty ramps up. This level has more of a focus on avoiding enemies while platforming. Once again, we see newer enemies, like hunchbacks, skeletons, and crows, each one being introduced in a safe area. Then when they show up later in the level, they are combined with platforming or other enemies. We also see returning enemies from level 2, like Medusa heads and statues. We're starting to see obstacles from previous levels combine together in order to create new challenges. Basically, the game is making sure that you have now started to master its mechanics. Once again, it helps that the secondary weapons you get in this level are very useful for these specific challenges. An example is that I get the clock right before this section with the statues and crows, which comes in really handy. As good as level 3 is, the boss is complete garbage. First off, you walk right through the mummy before the fight even begins. And second off, this. <laughs> boss fights where you just damage boost the whole time, hoping that you kill the boss before it kills you. These are never fun boss fights because there's no strategy or even clever way of beating the boss. And level 4 has problems. One thing I do like about level 4, however, is that it combines the bat and fishman enemies from level 1 and the moving platforms from level 2, thus creating a unique challenge. The problem now is that this area is really annoying. Like I said, the bats move faster than Simon, but they also move faster than the moving platforms, so if you're on one and a bat is coming, you have one chance to avoid it or else you instantly die. Not only that, but the fishmen in this level behave slightly differently than in level 1. In this stage, they can spawn right underneath you sometimes. Not only is this really cheap, but if you're on the moving platforms when this happens, you're screwed. 
Another thing that sucks about this specific section in the game is the graphics. And I don't mean about how the game looks aesthetically. For a game in 1987, this game looks pretty good, with a cool, medieval, creepy style. I'm specifically talking about how the graphics in this section can be a trap for first-time players. Okay, look at these skeletons on the ground. It looks like I can walk on them. Nope! How about these rock formations that look like they're part of the background? Nope! See what I mean? I'm sure that it wasn't intended to be like this, but the background and foreground make it really confusing as to what you're supposed to do and what you can even walk on. What sucks is that if you get confused, you lose a life. Well, you're already playing video games, so you're already losing your life. Which means that I'm losing my life. So, the beginning of this level is a bit of a mess. Let's hope it gets better in the next area. I'm just gonna let this riveting gameplay speak for itself. <laughs> After this, we fight three of these skeleton snake things. These are pretty fun to fight, and are basically mini-bosses, even though you can exploit the first one. And the boss fight in this level is also pretty good. It's much harder than the previous three fights. You need to hit Frankenstein while dodging this hunchback. It can be really intense and difficult, but there is a pattern to learn, and when you get into that rhythm, there's no stopping you. Level 4 ended off pretty strong. However, level 5 is my favorite level in the game. And... It's just the high difficulty level and the high playing ability that the game expects from you at this point in the game. Throwing all of the game's hardest enemies at you and introducing the hardest enemy in the game, the axe throwers. These guys have as much health as a boss, but can kill you in only four hits. Getting through this level requires that you have mastered this game's movement and weapon mechanics, especially in the final stretch. This corridor is one of the most notorious sections in gaming history because of how easy it is to die if you aren't perfect. The most brutal part about it is that right after this hallway, you have to fight death, the hardest boss fight in the game. He throws tons of axes at you, and like I said before, use of secondary weapons and committing to your jumps is key. This level is so good, it honestly should have been the final level. Because the final level... well... Level 4 has its problems, but overall, it's not that bad. The final level, however, is a hot mess. Once again, I'm gonna let the gameplay speak for itself. Never, ever, ever try to fight these bats. I like the idea of having to refight multiple of the giant bats from the first level, but it should have been done in an arena. 
Not a straightaway full of pits, where fighting basically means guaranteed death. So just get through this area as quickly as possible, damage boosting if you need to. After this, you fight some skeletons, and then... Oh boy. These... What the hell are these? Anyways, I'm just calling them enemy droppers. In level 4, they were just boring to fight. It wasn't anything horrible. But the main difference here is that now they're below you instead of above you. So you have to keep waiting for the right opportunity to slip by them. But the more you wait, the more enemies pile up below them, which basically means you just have to damage boost through the entire section, hoping that you make it through there before you die. And right after this section is the final boss. Yeah, level 6 is the shortest level in the game, and easily the worst. Pretty much the entire level can just be beaten by rushing through everything, and trying to fight the enemies is pointless, and will usually lead to death. You might be asking, if you damage boost through the whole level, you won't have enough health for the final boss. But this game has a workaround for this. When you get to Dracula's Keep, the game saves your progress, and no matter how many times you die, no matter how many game overs you get, you will always start right back here, which won't happen in any of the other levels. It's as if the developers knew how bad the previous section was. In fact, Castlevania is pretty generous overall with its save states. Each level is divided into three sections. If you die once, you go back to the beginning of the section you were on. If you die three times, you go all the way back to the beginning of the level. Never do you get a true game over where you need to start the whole game over. Which is really generous. Making someone replay the entire game all over again is one of the worst features a game can have. Contra! <coughs> <coughs> Having to replay a game that you just played through when all you want to do is get past the part you are at is one of the most tedious things ever. And I appreciate that Castlevania isn't that heartless, especially since this game is pretty difficult. I still think that going to the beginning of the level is pushing it a bit, but these levels are relatively short anyways. Therefore, it's very courteous to have infinite attempts at the final boss. As for the final boss itself, I kind of like it. It's one of the most iconic fights from any video game. You and Dracula, one-on-one. -on -one. The first phase is simple. You wait for him to shoot his fireballs, then you have a small window to jump and whip his head. It can be tricky to get the timing down, and it might get a little tense, but it's really not that hard. You knock his head off, and the second phase begins, and I have some issues with it. The fireballs are now harder to dodge, which is nice, but his jumping attack is the real problem. Dracula will do a short jump and a high jump. If he does a short jump, you can't get past him and you're getting hit. If he does a high jump, you barely have enough room to squeeze by without getting hit. Whether or not he does a high jump is determined entirely by RNG, meaning that you can die even with full health and lots of ammo for a secondary weapon. Unless you have holy... Holy water is your new god. In all seriousness, you can break the game with this thing. I mentioned earlier that Holy Water is a short-ranged attack that does tons of damage. I didn't tell you how much damage it does. The way Holy Water works is that anything caught in its blast is stunned on top of taking tons of damage. So you can just keep throwing it and piling infinite damage. This works on every boss, the knights, the statues, the axe throwers, nothing is safe. That means phase two of Dracula can be easily defeated. And just like that, 
You completed Castlevania. You get to watch the Castle of Chaos crumble. I said that Castlevania is a timeless classic. Not that it was perfect. In reality, every game has objective flaws. It's just a matter of if those flaws ruin the experience for you. And in the case of Castlevania, they may or may not. One thing I will always appreciate about this game is how it revolutionized how games were made, how game mechanics were taught, then put to the test. How trial and error was prioritized over replaying sections that you've already completed. And this music! Castlevania is well known for having some of the most fire music ever. Castlevania 1 may not have my favorite soundtrack in the series, but I definitely say it is the most iconic. Each song captures the environments and feelings that the player may have very well. I've been playing the game's music throughout the video, so if you like what you hear, check out Nico's 8-Bit Stereo. Also, do you see that watermark? I need money, so rewatch this video on 0.25 speed to really get the watch time going. And subscribe to my OnlyFans.